I am James Swanick, and today we are talking to Jenny Unglis, who is 52, who lives on the north coast of Northern Ireland. And Jenny runs a proofreading business. And as of today, Jenny is 124 days alcohol free, which is incredible. Uh, and Jenny uh, was one of our uh, Project 90 clients and has a very interesting story to share about her alcohol-free journey. Jenny, so great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm great, James. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. What does 124 days alcohol-free feel like, first of all? It feels great. And if you told me four months ago that I would be four months alcohol-free, I would probably have laughed in your face. <laughs> and why why would uh why would that have been so ridiculous a notion do you think because i i think i had tried for so long to kick the habit um largely by myself and and i just couldn't do it i just couldn't do it on my own um and that's why i eventually reached out to project 90 and uh it, it's not an exaggeration to say it's changed my life tell us a little bit about your life if you would jenny give us a little bit of context okay so i grew up in northern ireland um went to england uh to study at university uh ended up staying there worked in the civil service worked in parliament for quite a number of years um got tired of politics eventually and set up my own career coaching business, which I ran for uh, just over a decade. Then I got tired of London, tired of the rat race and came back home to the north coast of Northern Ireland where I've now settled. Um, met my husband, got married and within about a year of our getting married, Clive was diagnosed with multiple myeloma which is an incurable um, cancer of the blood and bone marrow so the next five years really became a, a roller coaster of chemotherapy radiotherapy stem cell transplants more chemotherapy until eventually um, it became clear that that his body just wasn't responding to treatment anymore and uh, sadly he he died in May of this year at home with me um, and that really was the point at which I realized my life could go in in one of two ways I could keep pouring booze on my head in a in an ineffectual attempt to deal with the grief and everything else or I could find a way of moving on that was more positive, more positive and um, more worthwhile. Um, so that really was a, a big turning point for me. That was the point at which I knew I needed to reach out and get help and support. Otherwise, I really would end up in a complete mess. Thank you for sharing that with us, Jenny. Um, you said that you were married within you were married, and then within a year he was diagnosed. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Take us back to that time, if you will, and you know, tell us about married life for the first year, and then when you both received that news, what impact did that have on you? Yeah. Um, it came out of the blue completely. I mean, we'd. We got married, we'd just literally moved into our dream home, which I'm still in. Um, everything was looking rosy. And Clive went for a, a standard checkup, just an annual checkup with the doctor. And his blood results came back slightly iffy. And the doctor said, I think we'll get this checked out. And we had lots more tests and, and it was diagnosed he was completely asymptomatic at that point um, so had it not been for the rigor of our, our doctor um, it probably wouldn't have been picked up until much later um, 
the fact that we knew from day one it was uncurable and we were really just playing a, a game of time was difficult. Um, it was a bit of, I suppose it was a sort of Damocles hanging over our head from the beginning. Um, it was a case of not knowing how long we would have, not knowing what kind of quality of life we would have. Um, and, and that was difficult. And if I'm honest, my coping mechanism was often alcohol, which was not a good coping mechanism. But that's that's what I often used just to, I suppose, what lots of people use it for, just to, to numb the edges, really. How old were you both when, when Clive was diagnosed? Um, I was in my late 40s. Clive was older than me. He was 18 years older than me. So he was uh, 65. Um, he actually used to be, I shouldn't tell you this, he actually used to be my teacher at school. He taught me classics at school. He was a very young teacher. And uh, um, I hadn't seen him since I'd left school. And when I came back here to Northern Ireland, we completely randomly met up and, and the rest was history. So it's, I suppose it's quite a romantic story, really. Did he yeah. charm you or did you, did you charm him? Well, like every other girl at school, I'd had the classic teenage crush on him. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, we charmed each other. <laughs> we had lots in common. We both loved loved um language words cricket tottenham hotspur so we had lots of music we had lots in common um he was just a great great man a, a, a legend really irreplaceable completely irreplaceable um but you know that's something that that i am working through um there are some very very difficult days but Again, I know that those days would be made more difficult if alcohol was still in the mix. And at least I am facing what I have to face with a much better degree of clarity than, than I would have had before. So, um, you said Clive passed in May of 2020. Yeah. Um, just to take us through the last um six months maybe maybe six months to a year and just maybe just describe what that was like for you and for him yeah. right up until the the day of his of his passing uh if you're willing to share of course yes um, of course. Of course. yeah so it was probably about a year um before he died that it became it became clear that that the chemotherapy he was on just wasn't working anymore they tried him on a few different versions. I mean, I have to say we had gold standard care. We had, we had wonderful care, but his body just wasn't responding to treatment. So the last year, he just gradually became less and less well. Um, by early in this year, uh, he was in and out of hospital several times. And then, of course, lockdown occurred. So the last three weeks when he was in hospital, I wasn't even able to go and visit him. That was very difficult. Um, and at that point, I actually rang his consultant and said, look, Clive's not getting better, is he? And he said, no. I said, how long has he got? He says, we're talking weeks. So at that point, I said, um, I just want him home. So we brought him home. Um, and at that stage, it was just palliative care, and he had three weeks at home with me before he died. Um, and that was that was precious time. Um, we were in lockdown, obviously, so no one could come and visit. And in one way, that was sad because there were friends he didn't get to see again. And in another way, selfishly, it was nice because. It was just, we had carers in and out and that sort of thing and doctors and nurses, but most of the time it was just us. So, you know, we had those last few weeks together um, and that was that was important to me. Mm. 
I'd imagine for him also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He got to see his beloved garden. He got to listen to music. He got to watch a bit of cricket. <laughs> Unfortunately, there wasn't much sport on, so that was a shame. But, um, yeah, we just, um, you know, he gradually got weaker and weaker. Um, and uh, he was in bed the whole time. But he was... Um, in good spirits, really, until the last couple of days. He wasn't in pain. When he was in pain, we had good pain control. So, and, and you know, he slipped away at the end, just holding my hand. So it was, it was difficult, but it could have been so much worse. So. Yeah. What things did he say to you or did you say to him before his passing um, that stick out to you, that stick in your memory, something that maybe he shared with you, something that you shared with him? Uh, a lot of people, you know, who've, who've suffered death in their family, a lot of times they don't get an opportunity to say goodbye. It happens suddenly. You had, um, you know, a long time, really. I mean, I guess you say five years, but yeah. probably in the in the last three weeks, you had three weeks. So was there something poignant or deliberate or intentional that you and he did together or said to each other? Um, looking back, we probably didn't maybe talk as much as we could have, but I think, I suppose in one way, everything that needed to be said had been said. As you say, we'd had a a long time to become accustomed. We knew what was going to happen. We talked about the the practical arrangements on his wishes and that sort of thing. Although obviously everything changed because of COVID anyway. Um, but the one thing I remember him saying to me in the last few days was he just said, "Jenny, keep going." Um, I think yeah, that was something that that stuck with me and has stayed with me and a large part of my motivation for getting alcohol free and, and trying to become that better version of myself really is is because I know that's what what Clive would have wanted and I know that he would have been so proud of me so yeah keep going is what he said yeah, beautiful. Uh, I want to actually, with your permission, um, read out an email that you sent to me on Sunday, February 9th of 2020. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. I, I have a, for those listening, I have a uh, an email list, a newsletter. I, I write an email a day, a daily, a daily email. <clears throat> some people love it. Some people are like, get me away from this guy. I don't want an email a day in my inbox but for those who are interested in the alcohol-free lifestyle, um, people get an email a day from me. And on um, Sunday, February 9th, you emailed me in response to a, um, a, a, an email that I wrote, which was called, Sorry, Alcohol, This Isn't Working Out. I feel frustrated when I'm around you, irritable, you disrupt my sleep, etc., etc." So I was actually writing like, like a letter to alcohol. And you actually responded to that um, and I was actually in uh, Mexico at the time. I was on a business mastermind. Um, this is before COVID, the COVID shutdown. And, uh, yeah, your email says, oh, I'll just read it here. It says, uh, hi, James, thank you for this. My situation is that my husband is dying of cancer. Uh, I think that a drink helps me deal with it, but obviously it doesn't. I need to enjoy the moments we have. So I'm just curious. You, you seemed at that point to have an idea that alcohol wasn't serving you, wasn't serving your best interests. Would you just uh, maybe elaborate on that a little bit as to what you were starting to come to terms with or starting yeah, to realise yeah. around that time in February? I mean, I'd, I'd known for a long time before that really that alcohol wasn't serving me and I'd been trying to, to kick it probably for 18 months or so. Um, and with, I suppose, varying degrees of success, but ultimately limited success. So I would have a sober stretch and then I'd drink again and, and that cycle would keep repeating itself. I was getting to the stage where I was having 
longer periods of not drinking, but always ended up going back to it. And, you know, eventually, that, that, you know, and, and when I, it's interesting, I don't even, I don't mean I don't remember that email. I don't remember. I knew I had contacted you before, long before I joined up with Project 90. I don't remember that it was in February. But, um, um yeah, I, I I knew I needed to tackle it and I was struggling to find an effective way to do that. Now, looking back now from the vantage point of four months and just having finished the Project 90 first stage and so on, um, I can see exactly what I was missing and it was the support, the community and the accountability and I didn't have that. I had friends around me who knew I was struggling. Clyde knew I was struggling, although he could see I was making some progress. But honestly, people around you, however much they love you, if they don't have the problem with alcohol that you have, they just don't get it. Um, however supportive they want to be, they don't understand. And, and people can be so well-meaning but you know friends might say to me something like well why don't you just try harder I actually went to my doctor at one point for some help and support and she said well why why don't you just have one drink um you know there was no understanding that for some people you know one's too many and 20 is not enough um so the thing that, that Project 90 gave to me was being in a group of people where, you know, the, the, the baseline for everyone was we are all trying to uh, reconfigure our relationship with alcohol. That was the given for everyone. So everyone, uh, regardless of where they were in their alcohol journey or regardless of what stage of rock bottom they had got to, um, everyone had that same basic common aim, which meant, in fact, that much of the time we spent on group calls, we weren't actually talking about alcohol at all. We were talking about all sorts of other things, and that, again, was what was so precious to me, that, that on one level, we were almost putting the whole alcohol thing to one side because that was a given. That was why we were there. So let's talk about other things. Let's talk about how we get more clarity. Let's talk about how we develop ourselves. Let's talk about things we're struggling with in other aspects of our lives. And, and just that sense of community and common purpose was the thing that I was missing. Um, and looking back, it's easy to see that, but it took me a long time to realise that. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's funny how people um, we normalize alcohol, don't we? Like we we normalize it. It's part of the social fabric. Uh, it begins when we're children, when our parents say to us, "Oh no, you can't drink alcohol now. You can have it when you're older." It's almost like a rite of passage, and then the rite of passage turns into, "Well, it's just something that you do. This is just the norm," and then it comes into something that people are. Uh, you know, uh, offer to you to, to be a good host. You know, if you're at a dinner party, you say, oh, can I get you some wine? Can I get you a beer? And it just becomes normalised, doesn't it? It's just normalised. And so it's very challenging um, to break out of that societal matrix, if you like, especially when you're um, later on. I mean, I'm in my um, mid-40s now, heading towards 50. You're in your early 50s. <laughs> That's like 25, 30 years of social conditioning or, or actually practicing consuming alcohol. It's actually a lifetime of social conditioning. So were there particular times where you found it really challenging to break out of that social conditioning where maybe people were drinking, you didn't want to, and then you towed the line and you, and you did, or maybe there was something that happened that was like you had a breakthrough? You want to just speak to that? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you're so right about the social conditioning. I mean, I, I was brought up in a in a family that that didn't drink, um, so it was probably 
um, not even when I went to university because I was I was too much of a swart to drink too much at uni. <laughs> but when I joined the civil service, um, that would have been the sort of early 90s very very big drinking culture and then I moved into parliament and if I thought the drinking culture was bad in the civil service let me tell you in parliament it was off the scale you know subsidized bars bars open all day drink at lunchtime absolutely drink after work completely you know it, it just was so embedded in the culture and I'm not saying that everyone who works in parliament is you know, is, is a drunk, but for anyone who um, had a tendency to, to drink quite a lot, it was just made so easy. Um, so that was probably where my, my problems began, really. Um, the interesting thing is that, that when I moved back over here, my social circle here it is not a heavy drinking circle. My friends I mean, my friends are the kind of people who'll have a glass of wine or two if they're out for dinner, but they're not drinkers. They would be what anyone would call a normal drinker. So I was probably the the exception. You know, I was the one who would be having the, the two extra glasses of wine. I would be the one who, who would have more than everyone else. Um, so I wasn't under social pressure in my environment here over the last number of years um, so I can't even use that as an excuse to be honest um, and I realized that you know certainly through Project 90 lots of people have often said and, and lots of people do say this that it's the the social situations that can be the most difficult and can be the most challenging and I have to put my hand on my heart and say that wasn't the case for me because that wasn't what my social environment was like. Um, so I don't even have that as an excuse. But I think I increasingly just came to use it, as I said, as a coping mechanism, as, as what I perceived to be a coping mechanism to, to take the edge off um, painful feelings and painful situations. And what have you come to learn now about alcohol taking the edge off and dealing with painful situations? That it is at best um, a temporary fix and at worst um, something which actually just makes everything worse. You know, alcohol doesn't take pain away. It just adds to it by the shame, the guilt, the hangover, the not being fully present. Um, you know, it, it brings nothing. It adds nothing. It serves you in no way whatsoever. You... Um you emailed me or you and I emailed back and forth a few times actually between February and when you actually enrolled in Project 90. There's a, an email here from you uh, dated <laughs> Tuesday, Stop June it. 16. <laughs> um, uh, th I'm just going to share just a couple things in here, which is just what you want, why you wanted to quit alcohol, um, if you're willing, of course. There's well, I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> Well, you just, you very, very simply said the two most important things for me would be first and foremost to stay sober. To me, that underpins everything else. Uh, if you think of an inverted triangle, my sobriety is the tip of that triangle. Without it, everything else is bound to topple. I'm willing to pretty much do anything to keep my sobriety intact. So that was the first one. And then the second one was, Secondly, um, you said, secondly, I need to plan and implement the next stage of my life. I have a pretty good idea what I want to do. It is entrepreneurial, would I, but I would be so glad of others' support, encouragement, and intellectual input. Um, obviously, underlying everything is my need to process my grief, which I know will take a long time. Uh, Clive was the light of my life, and he is irreplaceable. Uh, but the two priorities above are, I believe, things that will help me um, to do that. And then you went on a little bit more from there. But I guess my question is, um, did you feel 
do you feel like you're on that path now? Because you said back in June, your your priorities were to stay alcohol free. You used the word sober, but um, I like to use the word yeah. alcohol free. And then secondly, planning and implementing the next stage of your life. So that email was sent to me June, mid June. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you're you're on that on those paths? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, not only have I been alcohol free since the seventh of June, I think it was. But um, I'm I'm in a mindset now where I I just don't see myself ever lifting a drink again. Um, I know people often say, "Don't think about forever. Think about the next ninety days. Think about the next six months, whatever." But I have gained so much in and from the last four months that that I see. No way at all in which alcohol can serve me, and I see no need for it at all. I have no desire for it. In terms of what have the last four months looked like, um, yeah, I've I've just made, I've done so many things, James, that I would never, ever have done. A, because I wouldn't have had the focus, the energy, uh, and, and B, because I just wouldn't have been in the right place to do it. So, for example, I've recently set up my own proofreading business with a, a business partner. Um, I wouldn't have had the energy to do that. Um, I have, uh, I'm currently in the middle of training to be a Samaritan, which is a, a UK charity which provides a 24-7 listening service to people who are anxious, stressed, even suicidal. Uh, it's something I've been interested in for a long time, but I'd never have been in a position to offer that kind of support to anyone else, given the mess that I was in. Um, I started doing studying for a diploma, uh, actually in trauma and addiction counselling, because... It's just something that, through my own experience, really interests me. And I would never have had the stamina to do that level of academic study on top of setting up a new business and everything else. So my life has changed unrecognizably just in four months, which makes me, you know, despite the fact that I am and I suspect will be for a long time, processing grief um it makes me excited about my future in a way that I didn't think I would be capable of being and and that is you know the foundation for all of that is being alcohol free without a doubt obviously when you join our community here the the focus is to get you to rewire your brain around alcohol so you're powerfully choosing the alcohol free life but you also said there that your main uh, focus or or one of those main focuses and what will remain so is processing grief so how was the the community that you were in for those 90 days within project 90 how did that community help you to process your grief not so much quitting alcohol but actually processing your grief I I think that was one of the things that was most valuable. The the group were just fantastically supportive. Everyone has their own challenges. There are other people in the group who were dealing with um, children with special needs, dealing with uh, elderly parents who needed extra care. Everyone had... You know, everyone has something in their life that is a challenge. And the book was such a a safe place where you could share really quite personal feelings and thoughts and, you know, tears and vulnerabilities. And everyone was was so supportive. And, And just Many of the the lessons that we were taught were so helpful to me. One of the things which was most helpful to me, specifically in processing grief, 
was something that Kevin, Coach Kevin, said to me very early on, um, which was that life is a series of meetings and partings. And I just find that a really helpful and comforting way to look at it. Sometimes people talk about grief in terms of, well, one door closes and another one opens and that sort of thing. And I find that very final. But the idea of, of you know, life as a series of meetings and partings, I find uh, a very constructive way to um, to process some of my feelings. So specifically in terms of some of the advice, suggestions and approaches that I was given, and then more generally in terms of just the, the supportiveness and um, open armedness, if that is the word, of the group. Um, it was somewhere I could come and not be afraid to be vulnerable, not be afraid to show my sons. There were there were times on group calls when I, you know, I cried. Lots of people do. I always say you're not a proper member of Project 19 until you've cried on screen. <laughs> but that's just a demonstration of, um, you know, of how, how safe a place it is to share. And that was something that really, really gave me a lot of, um, a lot of emotional support. Mm. I also want to um, acknowledge you because uh, you, you're, you live in Northern Ireland and, of course, the time difference between <laughs> Northern Ireland and many of the, uh, the group coaching calls that we have um, is pretty big. Um, I have a, I, I'm on a weekly call on um, Thursday evenings, which is Friday morning for where I am at the moment in Australia. And what time did those, did my weekly uh, group call start, Jenny? For you, what time was it in Northern Ireland when they started? For me, that was one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we didn't wrap up until nearly three. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be an hour call, but we just got talking, yeah. didn't we? Well, you know, there were times you could have gone on all night. To be honest, I mean, they were great calls, but um, yeah, I, I made a commitment at the very beginning, and I, I made this commitment to Kevin that I would attend um, every single group call. Now, I did miss a couple of the Thursday night ones. Um, because there were a couple of times when I had to have an early start on the Friday morning. So, but um, I mean, I was doing a group call Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then my one-to-one -one coaching call with Kevin on a Wednesday. Um, why did I do that? Um, not just to get my money's worth. <laughs> um, I suppose it's partly I am quite an all-or-nothing person, but I knew that if this was going to stick and I was going to make this work, I had to give it everything I had. I was going to throw the kitchen sink at it because I kind of felt if this didn't work for me, nothing was going to work for me. So I, I knew that I wanted to give it everything. Um, and, and that's what I did. And I think, I think that stood me in good stead. Mm. Yeah, you, you said to me a couple of weeks ago that when, when Clive died, you had a choice. You could keep pouring booze down your throat and sink into a spiral of despair or you could find a way forward. Yeah. It certainly, from my, it, from my inspection, it seems like you have, you definitely chose moving forward especially demonstrated by the fact that you were up at 1 a.m. to attend um, one of those weekly group calls. I had to remind myself of that often when I saw you there. I'm like, oh, it's the middle of the night there. <laughs> but it's fascinating, isn't it? Like even myself, uh, you, you know, all human beings will come up with excuses as to why we can't do something or why something won't work or someone won't like me if I do this. <clears throat> I mean, even I, at the moment, I'm going through a process of um, securing a literary agent for my upcoming book, um, which is aimed at helping um, people to quit drinking. 
And uh, it's got to the point, it's a couple of days ago, it was at the point where I begin, let's now reach out to my extensive network and try to attract and secure a literary agent. And I drew up a list of all the names of acquaintances and friends and, you know, people in my network that I've, I've accumulated over, you know, a decade or so, 20 years living in, in, in America, quite frankly. And I still felt this kind of like natural um, pain in myself, like, oh, I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to like reach out to that person. I haven't really spoken to them in a year or so. And now I'm the, the one time I am reaching out, I'm asking for something. Oh, I feel awkward about that. It's incredible. And, and I'm usually fearless when it comes to that. But, um, but even me, like I felt that kind of like story. I was starting to create stories and I had self-judgments and then I had fear and then I thought I'm going to spend all this time doing it and what if it doesn't work out and I don't get a literary agent and I've spent all this money and time putting into, you know, into this project. Yeah. Um, so that's coming up to me and I coach people on this stuff, on how to overcome this stuff, you know. I'm, so it's a very natural feeling. But... Um, but you actually just went, you know what, it start, James's weekly call starts at one in the morning in Northern Ireland and you could have come up with a hundred different reasons and stories why not to attend and yet you still did. So what did you learn maybe about yourself in making that choice and sticking to it? Um, well, I mean, I suppose the whole purpose for me of, um, of going all in or, or leaning in fully, as as you guys would say, was I supposed to prove to myself that I did have stickability, you know, that I um, and also it's funny, one of the things which we, we talked a little bit before about being alcohol free, giving you much more clarity, one of the things that has been that has become very, very clear to me over the last few months is that one of the things that's really, really important to me is integrity of my word. So if I say I will do something, I will do it. If I say I will be somewhere, I will be there. Um, and it's actually the thing which pisses me off most about other people. <laughs> when When other people aren't like that, it's probably the thing that, disproportionately irritates me and maybe that's because it's something that's so important to me and that would not have been the case when I was drinking you know everything fell by the wayside um, and I constantly let people down but as that clarity came through for me I realized how important that is and therefore having made the commitment to Kevin at the beginning that I was going to be on every call I was going to be on every call um, and, you know, that's notwithstanding the fact that, yeah, sometimes it was very late at night or whatever. But you know what, James, I looked forward to those calls so much, especially in the early days. They were a lifeline to me. Um, you know, we were in lockdown. I just lost my husband. I couldn't visit friends. I couldn't see people. Um, and, and just having that that community of people who were all rooting for each other. You know, the, the calls in the very, very early days, as, as you know, I'm, it took me ages to get going on Marco Polo and start posting little videos and things, but I'm actually quite shy. Um, and in the early days, the group calls were kind of, oh, God, I hope Kevin doesn't ask me anything. And, and, you know, within a few weeks, I was actively looking forward to the calls and, and weekends where, oh, I'm just going to have to sit and watch 25 Marco Polos over and over again because there aren't any group calls. So they became something that was a really important part of the fabric of my life. Um, yeah. I love um, that. And now that I'm in the alumni group and I only have two calls a week, it's, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not that I didn't have other things to do. Um, I've been very busy with the business and with other things, but, you know, they say, don't you, that, that your real, pra your, your actions 
show what your real priorities are. You can say something's a priority, but actually it's only a priority if you do it. Yeah. And this was a real priority for me. Yeah, and I felt that and I sensed that and I saw that uh, certainly, you know, visually every week when you were when you turned up to my weekly call uh, at 1 a.m. Northern Ireland time. So, uh, again, I just want to acknowledge you for your commitment and for being on those calls at such an uncommon hour. <laughs> um, and I also w- want to thank you for, um, you know, inspiring other members as well because, you know, it doesn't require a big inspirational speech. It can just simply be sharing what is going on with you at the moment. It can be you saying, I'm really struggling at the moment, or you can say, I've had a really crappy week. And that inspires someone. It inspires someone else to be able to share about their week, which makes them feel better. And then that triggers conversation and it triggers healing and it triggers being out, sometimes being given the freedom to vent. Um, It's remarkable um, how many times I see you know, grown adults, because most of us are in, you know, the youngest member I think we had while you were going through was probably in uh, her late 30s. Most of the members are late, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, It's amazing when you see people who've never really had an opportunity to just be able to share what's going on for them in a safe space. First of all, just to be able to share at all, because sometimes we're lonely or we're isolated and there's just no one to talk these things through. But then secondly, to be able to share in a place where people don't criticize or condemn or make you wrong for whatever it is that you're sharing. Yeah. So in you doing that and you sharing and you being so open and vulnerable about what was going on with you, especially with you processing grief um, regarding Clive, that was huge for so many other members, I know, and they were all touched and inspired by you and, and you have left a, a lasting impact on those people. So thank you for that, Jenny. I think one of the things for me that that was really interesting and valuable about the whole process is when people do share, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why you and Kevin always encourage people to post on Marco Polo as well, when someone shares something, you never know what someone else is going to take from it. And, and what someone else takes from it and gains from it may absolutely not necessarily even be the central point that you're making. But but people will will take their own interpretation or or their own nugget of wisdom from something that someone else posts or says or shares. And to me, that's the great value of, of the group process. You know, one, one person in a group meeting of nine people could share something and each of the other eight people could take something completely different but equally valuable from what that person shares. And to me, that was the value of the, the group interactions, yeah. Well, Jenny... Keep going, as Clive said. Keep going. That's your mantra, I, I suspect. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah. And what does, just finally, what does keep going look like for you? Keep going looks like making a success of the business, um, carrying on with my diploma, which I hope to finish before Christmas, and then I've been accepted um, to do a an MSc in psychology, uh, which I'll do by distance learning with um, an English university, which will start in January. Um, and I will have to write a thesis as part of that. And I will probably it's early days yet, but I'm I'm interested in the area around. Um, People who have had a, a problem with alcohol quite often have issues around career and purpose, which are different from people who haven't necessarily had that struggle. I think it's a mixture of 
regret for a waste of time, wanting to make amends, wanting to give back in some way. And so I'm quite interested in, in some, uh, some work around the area of particularly helping people who possibly felt they've wasted a chunk of their life or not lived it to their best ability because of alcohol helping those people move forward and that's the sort of area I'd like to do a bit of research in. So yeah, lots lots on the horizon. I love it and congratulations. It all sounds very exciting. Um, just to let the listeners or viewers know, um, I've actually uh, experienced Jenny's proofreading business, which is amazing. <laughs> Um, I'm coming out with a, uh, well, actually, Jenny proofread my book proposal, which was amazing. Thank you so much. And then again, uh, Jenny also proofread my uh, gratitude journal, which is uh, should be coming out um, uh, early 2021, um, which is a, a daily journal to help tap into our unconscious and rewire limiting beliefs and uh, get us uh, and to reduce stress and anxiety. So thank you so much for that as well. What What is the name of that business and where can folks listening uh, find it and and uh, make contact with you? We are called Jackson Ray, um, www.jacksonray.com, which is Ray is W-R-A-Y. Uh, the company's named that because my business partner is, is called Stuart Ray, and Clive's surname was Jackson. I don't use his name because professionally I've always been Unglis, but the name, the company was named partly in honour of him because he was as much of a wordsmith as I am and, and he would have been proud to see what we're doing. So it's just something that keeps him tied into to my life as I go forward. Beautiful. I love it. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us uh, on this uh, on this interview, and I so appreciate you being vulnerable and being so forthcoming with um, your experience around um, you know grief and and trauma. Of course, Clive sounds like he was a wonderful man. Um, he and I share the same love of of, of English Premier League soccer team. <laughs> Uh, named Tottenham Hotspur. Our American fa- American listeners probably don't know what I'm talking about or don't care to, but um, uh, he, Clive certainly had very fine taste in English soccer teams. So I, I, I acknowledge you, Clive, up there. For your, <laughs> I am a huge Tottenham Hotspur fan. Um, yeah, so, uh, but all jokes aside, thank you so much for sharing with us. We so appreciate you, Jenny. And I look forward to, to watching you on your journey. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol-Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word Quit Guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word PROJECT90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word PROJECT90, that's one word, PROJECT90, to the number 44222. Feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? computer would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review this will help the show get in front of even more listeners potentially transforming someone's life you can rate and review the show inside of your apple podcast app on your phone or over on itunes on your desktop thank you so much and i'll catch you next time